عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. How are you? Alhamdulillah. It's one o'clock in the morning, Singapore time. Oh, I make it a point to stay awake this time. <laughs> May Allah help you. Amen. How is your family? Alhamdulillah. Which part of states do you st uh, are you staying, Doctor Uma? I am in a state called Georgia. Oh, okay, Georgia. Okay, I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to inshallah uh, Washington DC next week. Oh, I will be there as well. You will be there as well. Yes, uh, I'm visiting my parents for uh, Hari Raya. It's not. It's, it's breaking. The voice is breaking. Oh, I will be visiting my parents for Hari Raya. Oh, for Aidil Adha. Okay, mashallah. I'm, I'm, I'll be, my, my daughter, she, alhamdulillah, she obtained her residency in George Washington University Hospital. So I'll be joining her for a while. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, alhamdulillah. George Washington is a very uh, high class university. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, grace and mercy be to Allah. Wonderful. I'm so happy to hear this news. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. So will she be uh, living on the campus? Um, she managed to rent uh, one of the apartments, which is, she said, according to is about three minutes away from the hospital. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because she doesn't have, I mean, we don't drive and I don't want her to drive. So we just get a, an accommodation which is near to the hospital. Wonderful. MashaAllah. I wish her success. Thank you. We need all you do us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. And mm -hmm. the fact that you were able to spend time with her. Yeah, I, I, I'm retiring from my teaching um, on the thirtieth day, on the thirtieth of June, after forty-three years serving Ministry of Education Singapore. MashaAllah. <laughs> on the same day, I, I, I just inshallah join her, and stay for about a month or so. Oh, fabulous! Yeah. Then we would love to uh, host you at uh, our. Uh, place in uh, Virginia, in Reston, it's called. It is about, uh, it's close to the International Airport. Oh, was, uh, George Washington, I mean, uh, Washington is the airport. Yeah, because there's three airports. So the one that's in Virginia is called Washington Dulles International Airport. Oh. Uh, that is close to my parents' house. Inshallah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So uh, I will send you my contact information in case you don't have it. Inshallah. Uh, inshallah. And then contact me when uh, when you arrive, inshallah, and we hope to be of service to you and your family. Just two of us, my girl. Yeah, just two of us. The, the remaining of my kids, I have six children, so four of them are in Singapore, one of them in Australia, and one of them will be in Shabba in America. Wonderful. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Excellent. Which uh, part of Australia is your son? My daughter. I have five daughters and one son. Huh. So my my first daughter Aisha, uh, she's in Adelaide. She has been there for 23 years. Yeah. Wow. Wow. She studied there, married to an Aussie, and then that's it, stay there. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Alhamdulillah. Have you visited her there? Yes, yes. The, the last few days, uh, because of COVID, 
uh, we were not able to, but she came up, she came up to Singapore, yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. So I sent you my US phone number, and now I'm sending you our address in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. Inshallah, bro. Inshallah. You know, uh, when we first moved to Virginia in 1981, we used to pray at the George Washington University for Jum'ah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did not have any masjid near us, so we would drive 45 minutes to George Washington University. There was a church, and they let us uh, have the Jum'ah Salah in their basement. MashaAllah. Do we have um, do we have a mosque now in Islamic Center? I Google and I find it is an Islamic Center there now. Oh yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of growth in the community, mashallah. And the uh, Muslim students uh, at uh, George Washington University are very active. Alhamdulillah. But I think the medical campus is separate from the main campus. The medical care. Yeah. I will take a quick look at, uh, let's see, George Washington University uh, Medical School. School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Okay. So according to the map on Google, uh, yeah, it's close to the main campus. That's right. Good. That's very nice. Yeah, the area I think is called uh, Poggy Bottom. Mm. Yeah, it's not too far from the White House, actually. Mashallah. Wonderful. I'm so happy that you served uh, Singapore for so long, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. I was born here, butted here, so stayed here for 43 years teaching history and icons. And then I moved to counseling. I did specialize in education psychology and went into counseling for the students and the parents. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, these are all very important fields. Yep. Uh, so that you have joined us, uh, may Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear us, uh, Soda? Yes, I can hear very well. Welcome, Salaamu Alaikum.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. I would like to welcome all of you to class number two on Friday 23 June 2023. This is ITKI 6203, Islam and Family Institutions. We are in the summer 2023 trimester from June to August 2023 for IKI Academy, Institute of Knowledge Integration, and I am your instructor, Dr. Omar al -Talib. It is with great pleasure that I have you with me, uh, and we are joined by our first people who are in the Google Meet, Sister Bibi John, Sister Saudat, welcome, and I encourage all students to join our class early and to be a part of our discussion. We had a great uh, learning experience last session, alhamdulillah, and as I had said last time, please send me your questions, your thoughts, your concerns, your comments, your criticisms, and your advice. As we know, uh, we will uh, we are in the uh, month of Dhul Hijjah, the Islamic lunar month of Dhul Hijjah, and the first day, the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah are blessed. Uh, they end with the celebration of Eid Al Adha. There is the day of Arafah, uh, and then uh, the uh, uh, the end of Hajj, uh, the pilgrimage the Greater Pilgrimage to uh, Mecca. Some of you have already done the Greater Pilgrimage, the Hajj. Some of you uh, will do it in the future. Uh, I think all of you have family members and friends who have performed the Hajj. So we are in a blessed time period. Uh, for the United States, inshallah, Wednesday, 28 June, will be the first day of the four-day festival of Eid al-Adha, the Feast of Sacrifice. And during uh, this festival, during this celebration, during this uh, Feast of Sacrifice, uh, our community, our friends, our uh, families come together uh, and uh, we uh, try to uh, renew and strengthen our relationships to our Creator, uh, and uh, to strengthen ties within our families. Uh, we have <coughs> a new student with us, uh, Aisha Tu. Let me uh, just send her a message. Okay. I'm asking her to join our class. And I will send her the uh, the link. The Google Meet forward scholarship. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome, Aini Nalifa, to our class. Uh, and uh, so the festival of Eid al Adha embodies many things. It has a history, and it has a context, and it has a religious significance. So, in terms of Islam and family, salam aini. Uh, in terms of Islam and family, uh, we focus on Eid al-Abha for many reasons. One is to make sure that our children have the correct spiritual connection to our Creator. So we emphasize the role of being 
worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and uh, the necessity of having the direct, direct connection to our Creator. And then to relate the story of Ibrahim who was asked to sacrifice his son uh, and then uh, Allah uh, intervened and replaced the son with uh, a uh, an animal, some say sheep, some say ram. Uh, at any rate, uh, he sacrificed an animal instead of a human being. Now, a lot of people, uh, when uh, they hear the story, especially when we are young, it's a very strange story because here you have a prophet of Allah, a messenger, uh, Ibrahim, who from a young age has rejected idols and rejected sacrifices made to idols, uh, to uh, pagan symbolism, uh, to pagan gods. Uh, he refused to worship the sun, he refused to worship the moon, and he refused to worship any physical object. He refused to worship something that is a creation. And he was searching for the creator, uh, the uh, that which has created everything. And ultimately, he is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God, to the uh, creator. So now that he has learned about the creator, uh, why is it that he would sacrifice a human being and not just any human being, but his son, which would mean his most valuable possession, uh, killing his son for sacrifice to fulfill a desire to placate or to make happy his creator. Uh, this is something that uh, we find quite offensive in many cases and completely unacceptable because we are taught as Muslims that uh, we do not kill any human being. It is uh, haram, it is forbidden, it is wrong, whether it is for sacrifice or any other purpose. So how is it that a great messenger, a great prophet, Ibrahim, uh, the father of the Abrahamic religions, uh, the father of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, how is it that he would sacrifice a human being or be willing even to sacrifice a human being or be asked by Allah to sacrifice a human being? Here is where it is incredibly important to know about history. So, what can we learn from history? What we can learn from history is many things, including uh, the following. Oh, we lost uh, one of our members. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what do we learn from history? For a lot of human history, or most of human history, human beings uh, had a what we would call a very low level, or a primitive level, or a very basic level of science. They did not understand what was going on around them and why things happened the way uh, they happened. So they would see the sun, the sun and the sun, and they would not know what is the source of this light, what is the source of this heat, what is the source of this energy. And so it was a source of awe or uh, a source of uh, being incredibly impressed, and a source of uh, a big question, uh, a source of uh, something that is beyond them, beyond their understanding, beyond their comprehension. Same thing, they would see uh, the moon and its cycles, and they would see the plants uh, coming up from the earth, uh, not knowing what that uh, entailed scientifically how it happened, uh, how it's related to water and soil and minerals and organic materials uh, and uh, the rain and uh, seasons. 
uh, they simply saw it happening and would follow the patterns of the seasons in excuse me in order to stay alive during the farming period of human history so it wasn't until much later that human beings are were able to explain the amazing things the miracles that were happening around them so what is a miracle a miracle is essentially a physical process uh, that we have not yet been able to explain by science. So in the past, plants coming out from the earth after the rain was a miracle because humans did not have an explanation. They did not know what the process was, uh, what uh, the uh, details were, uh, what was the cause and the effect. Uh, and so uh, they would consider it a miracle, meaning something that is so amazing uh, and beyond expl uh, explanation and incredible, unexplainable, uh, out of this world, uh, so beyond uh, the human comprehension. So for most of human history, or for a lot of human history, things were miracles, things were not explained. And so humans would make an assumption, or they would make an attribution, that there's some strange force out there uh, that later came to be known as a, a, a god or set of gods that were the cause of all this. And so the ancient Egyptians, they had uh, their gods the ancient uh, Iraqis, the Mesopotamians, uh, the Babylonian civilization, the Assyrian civilization, uh, the Akkadian civilization, uh, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Indians, uh, the ancient Africans, the ancient uh, North and South Americans. So all these old societies, old civilizations, very old people, uh, which is why they, we call them ancient, that are thousands of years old, so uh, they attributed what was happening around them to gods or to uh, entities that are possessing different powers. Uh, in, in Greek civilization, for example, they had 12 gods, and each one was assigned to some kind of role uh, in, uh, in the universe or on Earth. So there was a god of the water, there was a god of thunder, uh, there was... Uh, uh, a god of love, uh, and so on. So uh, then the Romans, they essentially adopted the Greek gods, the 12 gods. So there was a head god, and then there's the sub-gods. But essentially, what they couldn't explain, which they would call miracles, they would uh, say that this was done by the gods. What humans did over time is, in appreciation for these miracles, that they got from the gods uh, because the way humans stay alive is through food uh, and uh, getting food was never guaranteed uh, and so the fact that some force brought them food out of the earth uh, from the uh, soil from the trees uh, this miracle that kept them alive they would respond by thinking whoever they thought was providing this life for humanity by making a sacrifice. Now, there were different ways of sacrificing and of uh, engaging in uh, sacrifice. Essentially, it was a way of distributing food to people in uh, the community, in the tribe, in the society. So they would have fruits and vegetables uh, and different items. But over time, they developed in some societies, in many societies, the idea of the, the biggest sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. So how can you give, what can you give to something that is keeping you alive and kept the generations before you alive, uh, your ancestors and uh, your predecessors, and then the generations to come alive? How do you thank them? How do you thank these so-called gods or entities or uh, the power that runs the universe, or uh, nature in some cases, uh, they would refer to it. Uh, how would you think it? How would you think them? 
they gave you life. Uh, it gave you life. It provided you with everything you need and your family needs to stay alive. What do you give in return? Because it's such a gift to have uh, food and to have clothing and to have shelter. And so over time, humans develop uh, this activity or many human societies of providing their most valuable possession as a sacrifice to the God. And what is the most valuable thing for a human being at that time? It's not a rock. It's not a tree. Uh, sorry, so that you have issues with your net connection. I hope it's uh, resolved. What was the most valuable thing that a human possessed over thousands of years? It was their child, their human child, their live child, especially their firstborn child, especially their firstborn son. Because when we get old, we need somebody to take care of us at that time. And the most important entity that took care of us when we get weak and old in human society is our firstborn son. Uh, over the thousands of years that humanity has been alive. And so that was the most valuable thing that humans possessed. So if you want to say thank you, the best gift that you would give, the most expensive gift that you would give, the most irreplaceable, the most uh, uh, un, uh, priceless gift that you would give was your firstborn son. So that became a practice. Humans killed their firstborn child for the gods. To say thank you to the gods and also to say to the gods, please don't hurt us, continue to help us. And it was in their conception that when the gods got mad, they died through storms or through uh, uh, starvation. And when the gods were happy, they got food and good harvest uh, and uh, good weather. And this is something that our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanted to end. No more human sacrifice. And this ending of human sacrifice and replacing it with an alternative uh, practice, uh, a better practice, a uh, more human practice, uh, a more civilized practice, was symbolized through what happened in the story of Ibrahim Stop killing your children. Instead, kill something valuable, but that is uh, not a, a human life. And that was the idea of sacrificing an animal. At that time, and for most of human history, food was important, it was critical. But the most valuable food, the hardest food to get, uh, the most expensive food, uh, the, the rarest food you could find was animal meat. It is not like today. Today, uh, uh, eating uh, meat is so common. You could do it every day, even poor people, middle class people. They can eat a hamburger every day, or they can eat kebab every day, or they can eat uh, satay if you are in. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, or Singapore. Uh, it's so cheap, it's so available, uh, it's everywhere, it's common. Uh, uh, in India and Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh, what is uh, a common meat to eat? Uh, uh, if any uh, of our students want to uh, provide us with insight into that, uh, maybe it's the uh, lamb gosht or uh, chicken. Uh, chicken tikka or tikka masala. In Africa also, right, uh, there are some uh, common meats that can be eaten. Uh, in Central Asia, uh, Sanjar, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> you interrupt me. Uh, I interrupt you. Uh, when it comes to Central Asia, the uh, to uh, different sacrifices made by central Asians, uh, nomadic uh, people uh, sac sacrifice uh, the a horse a white spot in head once uh, a year to 
uh, the god of uh, sun. It called Mitra. Uh, my, but is this is uh, you know Zarastrism. According to this uh, Zarastrism um, and other sedentary people uh, sacrifices the chicken at hand once a time. This is uh, also Zarastrist Buddhist. We call uh, Zardusht, Zardushtism. Uh, Zarastrism is it, uh, Europeans know this, English. Uh, yes, uh, it depends on the lifestyle of the people. Uh, uh, this one is a very expensive or very valuable for them. Nomads uh, sacrifice the horse, and some people sacrifice the uh, chicken. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, thank you for uh, sharing that, uh, Sanjar. Uh, so when I, uh, I want to uh, uh, underline what you have uh, said and to agree with you, when I went to uh, Uzbekistan, uh, when I went to Kyrgyzstan uh, and uh, Kazakhstan, as you said, uh, people eat horse. People eat horse meat, uh, which is uh, not the most common thing to eat in other parts of the world, but certainly common uh, in uh, Central Asia. And so meat, which is so common today, was very uncommon up until, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, meat was not common. It was rare. It was expensive. It was difficult. Uh, it was for special occasions. People only ate it once a month or once every six months or sometimes once a year, if they ate it uh, because they were too poor to uh, afford it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, embodying through the story of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham, and sacrificing uh, an animal instead of his son, is saying, you can sacrifice something expensive, but never a human life. And according to the Islamic tradition, in its essence and in its uh, teachings, a human life is priceless. It is irreplaceable. It is uh, something you cannot uh, consider to be sacrificable. Now, I can sacrifice myself to protect my family from danger, yes. But no one is allowed uh, to kill me or to kill an innocent child uh, as a sacrifice for any reason whatsoever. Now, there is a, a value to a human being legally. So, God forbid, if uh, a person killed another person by mistake. So, for example, uh, somebody was crossing the street. A car came, didn't see that person because it was at night, uh, and uh, they were not crossing from a proper place, uh, and their clothing was uh, not uh, observable, and they hit that person and killed them. So this is called involuntary manslaughter. You didn't mean to kill them, uh, but they got killed. Uh, and so in Islamic law, like in many other legal systems, there has to be some compensation paid to uh, the uh, dead, the deceased person's family. So there is a valuation put. But this is a compensation valuation and not really uh, a way of saying that this is how much uh, human beings are worth because human beings are considered priceless. Now, why am I going through this long story and uh, through this uh, explanation? Number one, to help explain the story of Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Abraham, and its relationship to the festival of Eid al-Adha that we will be uh, celebrating next week. Uh, and by the way, I mentioned in the Telegram group that for this class, we are not meeting next week. Uh, and uh, I encourage all of you to have a great and blessed Eid al-Adha and a wonderful and joyous occasion to be with your family and friends uh, and to uh, celebrate with the community and to also uh, share with the community uh, food and uh, donations and money uh, and uh, clothes and making everybody happy, especially uh, children. <clears throat> so there is an idea of sacrifice. It is a good idea. Then the issue becomes, what do you sacrifice? 
So in the past, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, meat was considered the best sacrifice. It is the most expensive thing. It is something that uh, most Muslims would not eat except uh, on an irregular basis. Uh, and same thing for the rest uh, of the world at that time. Today, meat is so common. It's everywhere. It's relatively cheap. Uh, so Muslims have to rethink this idea of killing animals because a lot of times, especially in Mecca now, uh, during the sacrifice that will happen uh, during Eid al-Adha, massive numbers of animals will be slaughtered and there's not enough uh, people to eat them. Uh, and the suggestion and the proposal was, well, the, that, the, one, the meat that is not eaten, you uh, refrigerate it, uh, you package it, you ship it to other places. But the fact of the matter is to do that, it is more expensive than killing the animal or giving uh, meat to them, uh, to the people who would have received this uh, frozen or packaged or uh, chilled or, or uh, <clears throat> properly uh, <clears throat> uh, transported meat. It's not worth it. It's too expensive uh, to save it than to just throw it away, which is a real tragedy. So what we need to do, and this is something we'll discuss in Ijtihad class, is think of alternatives. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did provide us with an example. He did slaughter animals during the festival of Eid. But we don't have to slaughter animals. We have to sacrifice, we have to provide something uh, to uh, our families, our neighbors, uh, and poor people, but it doesn't have to be an animal. There's so many things that uh, are useful and helpful for people today, uh, for them to eat, for them to enjoy. It doesn't have to be animal meat. In fact, uh, as I may have said before in here or other classes, uh, we have s started to have a diet with too much uh, animal meat. We need to focus uh, back on the diet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that our Creator has instilled in us to be healthy, and that is fruits and vegetables. Unprocessed, natural, fresh fruits and vegetables. No chemicals, no preservatives, uh, no uh, toxic, uh, poisonous substance put in the soil or put in the air uh, or <clears throat> provided uh, into the uh, uh, into the agricultural food stuff to food stuff to make it last longer. So there are uh, so there are many issues. One is converting from meat too much meat to fruits and vegetables, but also eating the fruits and vegetables that are healthy rather than that are processed. So eating a fresh banana is not not the same thing as eating a dried banana. And eating a dried banana which has lots of chemicals in it, to make it last longer is worse than eating a, a dried banana with no chemicals. And the other part of the meat industry uh, that is so terrible in this uh, world and that <clears throat> we have we should be protecting our children from it is most of the processed meat, so the meat you'd get at a restaurant or from the grocery store that has <clears throat> been processed has been raised on farms, on big farms, unfortunately, uh, where uh, the cows, for example, are given processed food, uh, and then uh, they are not allowed to move around uh, like regular cows. They are not allowed to eat the grass uh, around them like regular cows. And um, they are made to grow quickly through hormones and to get fat uh, quickly through hormones uh, and chemicals. Uh, and so what we are getting is not real meat. It is meat with chemicals and toxins and uh, other kinds of uh, <coughs> additives. And also the environment of the cows and the sheep that are being grown today on these uh, big uh, factories is very unhealthy. They get diseases. They get sick. Uh, they are living in their own filth, uh, in their own uh, urine and feces. So it's terrible. But it's a big secret. That the production companies don't want you to know. Uh, and so the worst kind of meat to eat is to go to a fast food restaurant 
uh, like McDonald's or uh, Burger King uh, or Kentucky Fried Chicken and then to eat that meat. Uh, it is full of terrible things for us. And furthermore, uh, especially the Western diet, uh, is too much meat and not enough fruits uh, and vegetables. If we are to be responsible for ourselves and our children, we have to teach them many things. Uh, it is necessary to teach the faith, uh, to teach spirituality, to teach Islam, to teach the Quran, to teach the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and also to treat them, to teach them, and to give them the proper diet, the proper food. So you need the spiritual diet in the heart, you need the mental diet, the strengthening of the mind, the information, the knowledge, the data. And we need the healthy food diet and to avoid, excuse me, the bad medicine and to focus on uh, the best uh, medicine, which is the, uh, the what is called the prophetic medicine or the alternative medicine, or sometimes in Asia it's called the Chinese medicine. Uh, each society has developed its own natural remedies, natural medicines. Of course, if you have a serious condition uh, like COVID-19, uh, God forbid, or you break your bone, you need to go to the hospital and get treated properly. But I'm saying most other diseases, we don't need these uh, manufactured medicines made out of chemicals and uh, poisons. Uh, what we need is natural healing through uh, proper diet, through proper minerals, through proper uh, vitamins, and through uh, healthy action, uh, which is exercise, which is uh, <clears throat> physical therapy, which is massage, which is uh, the uh, breathing the fresh air, uh, drinking clean water, uh, and uh, having activities in the environment. So to help our children grow breath better, we need to connect them to the uh, environment. Uh, eat, eating good food and uh, having activities in the natural environment, like riding horses, like uh, participating in uh, archery, uh, like swimming. So uh, there is a traditional Muslim idea of teaching kids. Uh, in Arabic, it is, uh, uh, teach your children uh, swimming, archery, uh, which is the bow and arrow, uh, and uh, riding the horse, horseback riding. These were taught to children in Islamic civilization, which made them stronger spiritually, mentally, and physically. And when you are stronger, uh, your body is stronger, you have a stronger immune system, you are less likely to get sick, and God forbid, if you get sick, then you can heal uh, faster and stronger as long as you avoid uh, the uh, manufactured, uh, the uh, factory medicines. Any questions so far or thoughts, ideas, uh, feedback? Okay, so I want you to discuss. Yes, Sanja. Uh, hello. Uh, when it comes to sacrifices, you know this, and uh, this is very widespread, widespread in also Muslim countries. You know the sacrifice to the jinns, uh, other than uh, the Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, it's a very uh, wide, uh, what how to say, uh, widespread in Uzbekistan too. There are many shamans. Uh, the they uh, sacrifice not only the hand uh, or uh, mostly ships they sacrifice ships to the jinns especially and they call themselves muslims but but they did they did are very uh, uh, and islamic you know this this type of we should uh, know about this type of sacrifices which is very an islamic and what what to say an ethical i think uh, what do you think of this and then uh, the other part of in the in the other part of the world yeah we have, we have this such kind of 
sacrifices, but sociologic, sociologically, uh, we should learn this, uh, I think, and discuss this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sanja, for pointing out uh, these uh, very important issues. Yes, uh, throughout the Muslim world, there are uh, many people who are engaging in uh, good activity, proper activity, uh, in Islamic activity. Uh, and unfortunately, there are people who engage in uh, other types of activities that uh, are problematic. And one of them is, as you said, engaging in sacrifices, whether it's to the jinn uh, or to uh, uh, natural entities or to uh, pagan entities or to uh, a sheikh who has passed away and you go to the, the grave of this uh, saint or scholar uh, and you uh, provide some type of sacrifice or you ask them uh, to intercede uh, and to give you uh, health or to uh, solve a, mar a marriage problem for you or to give you children um, and uh, the involvement of shamans and killing of uh, animals like uh, chicken or even sheep. Absolutely, all these are problematic activities that Muslims still engage in. Uh, Muslims have a very sometimes problematic understandings of the jinn uh, and of uh, the evil eye or hasad. Uh, do, you, do you know what uh, I mean when I say evil eye? Uh, you see it sometimes in people's houses or taxis or cars. There's this blue eye uh, or blue circle, uh, which they have or put in a uh, necklace around their child's neck uh, or on their body uh, to protect from uh, jealousy. Uh, the word uh, in Arabic is, is hasad, uh, jealousy, uh, to keep uh, people who may have bad intentions against you or against your child or against your property uh, to keep away their evil intentions. So people use something called e evil eye uh, or they go to uh, shamans or priestesses and they say, please do something to protect us or to protect our children or to give us a child if they are not able uh, to have children. So all these are problematic. They go against uh, the creed of Islam, the Aqidah. So Islamic creed requires you to ask uh, for uh, health uh, and wealth and goodness from our Creator directly from Allah. There should be no intercessor between you and the Creator. It should be direct relationship as the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught us. But uh, people are affected by other societies or by uh, cultures from the past or by uh, misguided ideas. So they want somebody or something to uh, help them get something rather than asking or depending on it uh, directly from our Creator, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One interesting th thing that I found, uh, and this may have to do with magic, is in Malaysia and Indonesia, many cats, somebody cut off their tail. They see cats, uh, stray cats walking around the city, but they have no tail, which is very strange because the animal, the cat, is born with a tail. So I was told that this is uh, the tail is used for astaghfirullah, uh, for magic, for uh, shamanism, for <coughs> uh, priestesses, for different magic rituals uh, that uh, are held by uh, some people. So how do we inoculate or what is our responsibility toward our children? Uh, how does uh, Islam uh, provide uh, the proper uh, behavior in this context for the family, for the children? Here it is very important to make it very clear throughout the child's life that the single most important entity is their creator. And that is the primary relationship. You love your parents because of the relationship that the Creator 
made for us between us and our parents. We do good because of the necessity of making our Creator happy and staying close to our Creator and keeping our hearts pure. We seek knowledge to satisfy our Creator and to be better worshipers. So everything we do revolves around our Creator. This is how children need to be brought up so that they don't become uh, materialistic, overly materialistic, focusing on objects, on, on shiny things, and on owning things to the detriment of their relationship with Allah uh, and their spiritual health and their mental health. So any issue that has to do with uh, distraction from our relationship to the Creator needs to be uh, <clears throat> addressed and uh, properly uh, encapsulated and diverted. So for example, this issue of the jinn. Do the jinn exist? Well, according to the Quran, yes, there are humans and there are jinn. Uh, what do we know about the jinn from the Quran? We know they exist. We know some of them uh, follow uh, Allah, some of them do not. We know that they speak among themselves and they uh, uh, have children uh, and they populate their own world, their own realm. And we know uh, that uh, uh, they uh, can uh, uh, spread certain ideas. But we also have to be very clear and teach our children that the jinn can never harm us. They can never do anything that will hurt us in our world, in our uh, physical life. Some people claim when a person becomes crazy or be has mental problems, they will say something uh, that uh, a jinn has uh, controlled them. Especially in many Arab cultures, even in Iraq, they would say usually if somebody has a mental illness, uh, especially if she's a woman, uh, that the jinn has taken over her body. This is completely uh, wrong according to Islamic creed, uh, Islamic thought. It is wrong according to our Quranic teachings and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. A jinn can never take control over you, can never force you to do anything, can never harm you. That is impossible. But people believe that, unfortunately. Muslims, uh, sometimes they believe that. And then they go to these other Muslims who claim they can remove the jinn uh, from uh, your body and sometimes many tragedies happen one time there was a case in Dubai where uh, a brother uh, was claiming that he can get rid of jinn uh, and somebody who had some mental issues uh, he said yes help me so he took him uh, to the sea and uh, he was trying to put him in the water to force the jinn out but then that person uh, the person with the mental illness, he died. He, he drowned in the water. So here you have a case of uh, murder, of uh, killing, uh, of death uh, by somebody who claims that they can, rid of, can get rid of jinn. Even if it doesn't lead to death, these people who claim that they can get rid of jinn are taking your money uh, and making uh, false claims. Uh, and at the end, they make you drink some water with some uh, Quranic verses that are uh, on a piece of paper that are then dipped in the water uh, or other rituals that they do, claiming that they're going to get rid of the jinn that it controls you. Unfortunately, this is uh, complete uh, nonsense. It is folk rituals. It is taken from uh, previous societies or other societies or less developed societies, tribal culture, uh, uh, the culture of uh, certain uh, uh, areas of, of the world where uh, the uh, shamanism and paganism and nature worship uh, is more common. So we're not uh, saying uh, practices in and of themselves are good or bad, but if we are to evaluate it according to Islam, then it has to be very clear that uh, Islam is a faith based upon a relationship with the Creator, and nothing can harm you from what is called jinn. Impossible.
and there is no such thing as the evil eye. People can have jealousy, of course. This is part of human uh, <clears throat> humanity. This is part of the human experience. But unless they do something to you physically, that physical harm, it will be harmful. Uh, but just if they just wish that you uh, fail or they wish that you become poor or they wish that you die, nothing uh, doesn't mean anything. It doesn't uh, affect you. That wishing does not affect you. And you cannot prevent that wish by putting on a certain amulet or charm uh, or uh, blue uh, circle, uh, even though uh, many Muslims, many Muslim societies practice uh, this uh, kind of protection from the evil eye. And I'm sure it shows up in all of your societies in different ways. Uh, <clears throat> in Iraq, in Mosul, when the child is born, they take a pin and put a little uh, charm amulet uh, on their clothes to protect the child. And in many Sufi groups, they tell you to wear a certain necklace with some uh, pouch with verses of the Quran in it to protect you. Some people uh, stick a Quran in their car, not to read it, but to protect the car from uh, an accident happening. That's not how the Quran works. Uh, the Quran works, uh, and we need to teach our children this uh, to preserve uh, Islam in, in family life. The Quran works by reading it, understanding it, and implementing it. That's how it works. It doesn't work like a charm or a magic uh, bracelet or uh, through uh, some kind of ritual. Uh, <clears throat> that's not uh, what Allah tells us to do with the Quran. Some people just put the Quran on a shelf in their house and they assume this will protect their house. That's not true. It's uh, not correct. Anybody else with any uh, question or uh, response or thought uh, to what we have been discussing or anything else uh, that comes to your mind? Okay, as we go along, please, uh, please participate. So, uh, so I, I brought up the Eid issue. So Eid is a celebration. Uh, Eid is a sacrifice. But let's talk about and have discussions with your families and with your religious leaders. Can we find alternatives to animals? Uh, it could be money. It could be uh, something else that helps poor people. Uh, that's much better than uh, killing an animal. Because at the end of the day, it's not the animal that's important. It's helping the poor people. That is what's important. So if there are better and uh, more effective ways of helping poor people, then so be it. Uh, and people do it. People do give money. Uh, but I'm saying to, to reduce and to stop this unnecessary slaughtering uh, of animals that no longer serves the same purpose that it had served uh, uh, in the past at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and to make better use of our resources. To be better human beings the environment now is so polluted and in such very bad shape that raising more animals is hurting the environment destroying their environment we need to have less animals i mean domestic animals uh, cows and sheep uh, and chicken and we need to have more uh, healthy food uh, more productive food more natural food more organic food you know, to save ourselves and to save uh, the rest of the human race <clears throat> from the diseases and from the <clears throat> chemicals and the uh, toxic poisons that uh, are being put into our, our bodies. <clears throat> Let me end the discussion about uh, Eid al-Adha by saying it is a four-day celebration. So it is essential to connect with family, with friends, uh, with neighbors, and with the community. And this is not easy. Uh, many of us live far away from our families. Many of us don't even know our neighbors. Many of us don't have the best relationship with uh, other Muslims uh, and even non-Muslims. And this is a problem. So we need to emphasize, especially during Eid, that we go to people's houses who we never went to before, and we say Eid Mubarak, including non-Muslim houses. 
we go there, we share in the celebration, we share in the joy, and we share in the message uh, that uh, we should all work together to uh, increase our spiritual strength and reduce the uh, problem of poverty and uh, disease in, in our communities uh, from all religious backgrounds. Another thing that's important to educate our children uh, regarding uh, Eid al-Adha is uh, this idea uh, of celebration. So Islam has two formal celebrations, as we know. Uh, Eid al-Fitr at the end of Ramadan and Eid al-Adha. From a sociological point of view, when sociologists study celebrations, holidays, uh, what are the themes, what are the ideas that emerge? So the word holiday in English comes from holy day. It means a special day where you reconnect to uh, the religious uh, elements, to uh, your faith, to your religion. Establish stronger relations, establish stronger connections. So on a weekly basis, for Muslims it is Friday where the uh, Juma prayer is held. So today is Friday. So for those of you who have already done Juma prayer, may Allah accept it from you. For those of you who will be doing Juma prayer, uh, may Allah accept it from you, inshallah. Uh, and so Juma is weekly for Muslims on Friday. For Jews, there is the Sabbath on Saturday. Uh, and for many Christians around the world, Sunday is the holy day. But then uh, in terms of the yearly basis, uh, there are different religious traditions that have different holidays. So since Muslims have something called Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, we see here the connection to uh, the uh, festival of breakfast, which is Eid al-Fitr, and the festival of sacrifice. So the themes of uh, fasting and breaking the fast uh, and sacrificing are important themes for all of humanity and also for people in the uh, religious communities and for the Muslim Ummah. But this has to be taught to the children. What is so important about fasting and then breaking the fast? What is so important about sacrificing? What do we sacrifice? Who do we sacrifice it to? How do we sacrifice? The notion that when the people who have give something to the people who don't have, is very important in human society. But how it is done is just as important. So if you have something, you should share it with somebody who doesn't have it. Uh, if something you don't need, uh, you need you, you uh, should try to share it with somebody who needs it more uh, or who has a greater need. But the way you share it is through humility. You don't make the person who is receiving the gift or the charity or the zakat or the sadaqah, you don't make them feel bad. You don't make them feel uh, that they are uh, bad, uh, terrible people or that they are uh, unwanted people or that they are uh, lesser people than you. You treat them with the same respect you treat uh, any other person and you thank them for accepting the gift from you. So that, rather than giving them food or money and waiting for them to say thank you, no, you say thank you to them because they are enabling you to get reward from our Creator, from Allah, by helping them. They are doing you a favor. They are enabling you to get closer to Jannah, to get closer to heaven, uh, to get closer to the Creator. So the process is a process of humility, of sharing, of genuine intent to serve those who are in need. And this idea of service, which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, emphasized so much, is very hard for human beings to acculturate to, to, uh, to get used to, uh, to be part of their mentality uh, and their behavior. Why is uh, this uh, attitude of service so difficult? Because especially in the modern world, uh, we are so focused on uh, accumulation, on wealth, on uh, getting ahead, 
uh, on having uh, <clears throat> better education, better jobs, uh, better careers, better retirement, uh, better house, better cars. These material things and these uh, enablers of wealth become the focus rather than the means, rather than the tools. So we have the goal and we have the way to achieve the goal. So the focus should be on the goal, not on the means to the goal. But in modern life, we end up focusing too much, many of us, on the means rather than the goal itself. So people uh, would like to have a bigger house, nicer house, better neighborhood. Uh, and that becomes the thing that is on their mind and that they are uh, pursuing with full power and vigor. Uh, and if they were stopped and asked, is this, is this your goal, just to have the better house, the better neighborhood, the better job, or is it something else? Uh, sometimes they forget that this is just the tool. What we want in the end is to serve our creator, to have the means to raise our family in a better way. And sometimes the big house, uh, the expensive neighborhood, the nice car, hurts our family more than it helps. What do I mean? I mean, normally we think of giving our kids uh, nicer things, better things, more expensive things, uh, more complicated things, more high-level things, is the way to make them happy, and that is what we should do as parents. This idea should be challenged, or can be challenged, or is challenged, uh, when we look at this whole issue of uh, making our children happy. First of all, is happiness a goal or just a means? Modern society has made happiness into the goal. When in fact, it is just the means to something better or can be perceived as a means. Uh, how can we illustrate this? For example, <coughs> happiness is a state of mind which can change, can rise uh, and fall over time. So if happiness is my goal, then it's something that I can never achieve because there's always something that might make me more happy. Whereas if happiness is a tool, is a, uh, is a means to an end, then what I can do, and this is what, I, uh, what we would want to teach our children, is <clears throat> you try to uh, help yourself become more happy so that you can uh, be a better person in society. You can treat yourself better, your parents better, your family better, and uh, society better. So a depressed person, an unhappy person, uh, has difficulty in addressing their own needs and the needs of those around them. But a happier person is more likely to share their money, to share their food, uh, to uh, share their happiness, uh, to share their excitement, and to make the world, the world a better place. So happiness is a tool, it's a means to make the world a better place. It's to get you engaged more in society and to get you to care more about people and the environment uh, and what is happening. Rather than being <clears throat> just by itself its own goal. So a bigger house, people think will make them happy. When in fact, it's just another material object uh, that may or may not make you happy. And it may make you happy for a certain period of time, but once you get used to it, then you look for other things. Same thing with money, same thing with being famous. So if we look at television and if we look at social media and if we look at uh, the uh, movies and if we look at uh, newspapers and if we look at magazines, how do they show the uh, people who are famous actors uh, and singers and sports players. <clears throat> they project this image that these are the people who are happy and that there's an association between their being famous and rich uh, with their being happy. When in fact, in reality, sociological and economic and psychological studies have shown many of these rich and famous people, they are not happy. You may think they're happy, and when they take their picture, they look happy. 
and in the social media they look happy. But in reality, many of them are not happy. And they die from suicide, they die from drug overdose, uh, they are depressed, uh, they have mental problems. <clears throat> but we don't see that. This is not something that is shown to us. It is hidden uh, from us, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is, is a different issue. And so what our children see on the TV and in the social media and in the movies is these famous actors and uh, sports uh, heroes uh, and uh, the uh, singers and dancers as something that is amazing, wonderful, uh, that they have this great life, that they can do whatever they want, go wherever they want, uh, have uh, a, a, an amazing and happy life. This is the impression. This is the misimpression. In reality, it varies a lot. By itself, money may or may not make you happy. It is true happiness, however, when that money, if you have it, you use it uh, in productive and uh, helpful ways, not having it by itself. So in, in the Quran, when it talks about Qarun, uh, uh, at the time of the Egyptian pharaohs and how he had so much money uh, nobody knows how much it was maybe he didn't even know how much wealth he had how much gold and silver uh, and uh, other types of wealth he had and he was accumulating it for himself he didn't share it so why would the Quran make this into a problem because the Quran is emphasizing that material objects by themselves are not the things that enrich our lives and make us good human beings. Sharing those things make us better people, being productive. So if Qarun took that money and made a company that gave jobs to people uh, and uh, provided services to society, that's a good thing. This is productive or any modern day uh, <clears throat> business person uh, or wealthy person, okay, uh, you can keep the money in the bank and then use it to spend on uh, fancy vacations for yourself uh, and a big mansion and sports cars. You could do that uh, and you can accumulate sometimes so many houses and so many cars. But <clears throat> what is much more productive uh, for society, for the future, uh, is to use that wealth to invest in society, in the economy, uh, to uh, establish companies or to uh, give uh, money to companies, investments to companies uh, that are providing food and that are providing uh, services to people. This is productive. This is helpful. Uh, this makes the world a better place. And this ultimately is the goal or the way to achieve uh, the recognition from our creator that we are doing good, good deeds by using uh, the wealth for uh, positive ends rather than negative ends. And here is a mistake that uh, many people make. And that is they say, oh, you see those rich people? They will be punished because they are rich. You see those billionaires? How come there's uh, billions of poor people who are barely alive and many of whom are starving? And then you have the billionaires who have so much money, they will never need that much money. Uh, and because they are billionaires, therefore they are bad people. This is a problem we need to be aware of and careful about. Being rich or being poor in the Islamic perspective is not by itself good or bad. Islam never said rich people are bad or poor people are bad or rich people are good or poor people are good because they are rich or because they are poor. Never. Not in the Quran, not in the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What Islam emphasizes is what you are doing. First of all, how you got that wealth. Is it halal income or haram income? So getting it can be good or bad, can be positive or negative. And then using it, spending it, uh, uh, providing it, uh, making it part of the uh, social and economic uh, process, 
this is what is positive and negative. So if you invest it, if you make uh, Waqaf foundations, uh, if you uh, build uh, better uh, facilities, uh, if you uh, establish companies uh, that uh, employ people and that provide jobs, uh, if you provide services uh, for people like cell phone service uh, or <clears throat> travel services, all kinds of services that are helpful for people. So this is a good use of the money. This will be rewarded. So it's not about being rich or poor. It's about how you are able to become rich, whether it is uh, through rizq uh, halal, uh, acceptable uh, income or unacceptable, and then how you then uh, use this trust from Allah to uh, help yourself become better uh, or those around you uh, become better uh, by sharing and investing and uh, putting it to uh, productive uses. So the people who complain about the billionaires, I think have, or from one perspective, have a misplaced criticism or a misplaced complaint. The complaint is not about the billionaires. The complaint is how the wealth is or is not used. Same thing with poor people. Some people, unfortunately, look down on poor people and say, yeah, it is their fault that they uh, are uh, addicted to alcohol or they are on drugs or uh, they uh, uh, neglected their family. Or that is why they are poor. And that may be the case. It's true for some people. Uh, but the problem of poverty uh, is a worldwide problem uh, that is not caused by poor people. Poor people are victims, for the most part, of uh, different issues that led to their poverty. And one of the biggest causes of poverty in the world throughout human history has been uh, the government. Actions by the government. Usually it's because of war that people uh, become uh, poor and starve to death or diseases are spread. The biggest spreader and killer of spreader of diseases and killer of humans in human history is war. And who causes war? The government, uh, for the most part. And so <clears throat> that's where the problem is. That's, those are the causes of poverty, uh, among other things. Environmental destruction causes poverty. Pollution causes poverty. So when people don't have access to clean water, clean air, uh, healthy food, uh, then uh, they can starve, they can get sick, they can uh, become poor. And this is a big issue. So that's where the solution lies in uh, these practices uh, being practiced either by the government or by uh, <clears throat> entities that break the law uh, or that uh, engage in destructive activities. So when we teach our children about uh, money, about poverty, about wealth, the emphasis that can be made uh, and that is uh, promoted uh, from my point of view, from the point of view of uh, some sociological studies, is the nature of how it was gotten, how it was received, and the nature of how it is used, how it is uh, made productive. So it's the use and abuse, whether it leads to poverty or whether it leads to uh, wealth, uh, that is critical. Uh, everything clear so far? Uh, any questions at this point? Yes, Sanja. Uh, one question. It's not a question, but uh, like this, uh, I would like to discuss this topic with others with you. Uh, you know, uh, in secularized society, Muslim societies, such holidays, uh celebrated like as a ritual it doesn't make any sense for them but uh, i'm not sure uh, how it's uh, in the western societies among the muslims it celebration of both of aids uh does uh, do any make uh, does any make sense 
positive Muslim communities, especially for children. Because, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, holidays, uh, not just about the faith or about the uh, performing such some kind of uh, uh, following the, uh, the uh, Sunnah of Prophet but uh, such holidays also uh, help to uh, the children internalize uh, the Islamic norms and Islamic uh, the teachings, I think. Uh, it helps, you know, the, in sociology there is the concept of uh, socialization. Socialization, which means uh, internal, internalization of uh, norms uh, in, in a society by the members of the community or society. So what do you think of with this? Uh, is this uh, this uh, celebration of this kind of uh, holidays still uh, does it make any sense for the Muslim community in the West, or it's just like a ritual? Thank you very much. Uh, may Allah bless you, Sanjara. I appreciate uh, these points that you have raised uh, and the questions that you have asked, and I hope it is clear for the rest of the class uh, please uh, raise your hand if you need the clarification. So uh, an aspect uh, that um, uh, has been pointed out has to do with holidays, and there are um, religious holidays, there are secular holidays. And part of the issue uh, with many religious holidays, especially for children, like you point out, is it becomes a, 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 an empty ritual. Uh, like you said, it does not make sense uh, they, uh, many Muslim children and non-Muslim children do not learn the context of the holiday, are not really sure of why people are doing it. Uh, in a sense, for many children, they do it just because they're told to do it, just because they uh, are uh, being uh, given a tradition through their parents, uh, and it's because their parents and grandparents did it, that's why they do it rather than real understanding and commitment uh, to the holiday itself, to the uh, holy, uh, spiritual, uh, important aspects uh, of this uh, event. Uh, and so whether it's uh, the uh, five main uh, Islamic uh, ritual practices, like the prayer and the uh, zakat, uh, the kordu and the fasting in Ramadan, when it becomes just a ritual, uh, then it's problematic. What do you mean? What do we mean when we say it becomes just a ritual? Uh, what is meant usually is it becomes just a habit that's done uh, in and of itself. That's done done just because uh, around you it is happening, and uh, your parents taught you to do it without any real understanding or commitment or uh, focus on. Uh, how this is part of some uh, bigger goal, some larger context. So what do uh, what can parents do about this? They can teach their children that uh, the reasons, uh, the many possible explanations of the holidays, especially the religious holidays, uh, the aspect of Eid al-Adha that has to do with uh, how do you please your creator in the best possible way, and the ritual of Hajj, how do you purify yourself by going through activities that indicate uh, a desire to serve the Creator? So in Hajj, for those of you who have done Hajj, right, you remember you do the Tawaf uh, around the Kaaba. You go around the Kaaba seven times. So children need to learn before they ever go to Hajj, what is the Kaaba? What is the idea behind going around the Kaaba seven times? What is Safa and Marwa? And this idea of going between them seven times. Sa'i, uh, in Arabic it's called, uh, between Safa and Marwa. And then uh, the idea of going to Mina and the idea of stoning the representation of the devil with uh, small stones, uh, al-jamarat, uh, small stones, uh, they are called. 
uh, and uh, standing uh, on the hill on the day of Arafah, and then uh, the sacrifice. We need to give our children these stories and these actions and the explanations for these actions. And if we don't know them, we uh, find out or we take our children to people who uh, can explain it to them. And just as important in all of this, uh, we need to allow our children to ask the toughest questions. Because our children, once we sit down with them and we say, uh, for example, as Muslims, uh, we have to do Hajj, they will say, why? And then we have to explain to them it is a requirement from our Creator, and they will uh, do a follow-up question, why? And then we talk about how we strengthen our relationship with the Creator, and our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us how to do this uh, required activity of a Muslim one time at least in their life and the child will then say again why we need to be prepared and to be patient uh, and bibi john you have been an educator for many years you know a lot about this continuously answering the children's questions and we can say we don't know when we don't know and we can try to come up with possible explanations but Regardless of whether we can answer the question or not, making a child feel comfortable asking these questions is absolutely critical. So when we narrate the verses in the Quran about Prophet Abraham uh, killing his, willing to kill his, uh, his son, the children, if we are allow them to ask, and we shouldn't allow them to ask, they will say, why? So we need to come up with some possible explanation. Well, Abraham was trying to make uh, Allah happy, to make the Creator happy. Well, why is it done to killing his kids? Uh, and then you, you explain to them that was the most valuable and precious thing that Abraham owned. And then they say, well, but isn't it barbaric? Isn't it uh, terrible? You could say, yes, killing a human being is not allowed. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, rather than killing a child, you sacrifice an animal. So you, you allow the child to go through this reasoning process. The validity of the answer isn't as important as the process where you let the child think. You allow them to develop their creativity and their thinking uh, ability. This gets them beyond the ritual stage, like Sanjar, uh, you correctly pointed out, and it makes it more meaningful. It gives the event meaning, and this is critical. A lot of Muslims and even non-Muslims, uh, their rituals are meaningful if they try to understand and to uh, enhance it uh, cognitively and emotionally. Or in many cases for Muslims and non-Muslims, the prayer, the fasting, even the zakat, giving the kordu, becomes meaningless. They might do it, yes, but it's there's no real commitment and uh, sense of belonging in doing it, uh, it becomes meaningless. And that is what we mean when it becomes a hollow ritual. It, it, it becomes without meaning. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have uh, an emotional and a uh, mental attachment to the person doing it. If a child prays only because their mother or father forced them to pray, this is a real problem. They, they need to be taught that they are praying to make their Creator happy, to strengthen their relationship with their Creator, and to continuously try to understand and implement the Qur'an, the verses of the Qur'an that they are reading in the prayer, and to establish this continuous uh, connection with the Creator and the humility of sujood, uh, so these are meanings attached to the prayer uh, that give it significance. Otherwise, the prayer becomes even uh, becomes less significant or insignificant. Now, if you talk about secular holidays, we have a different uh, set of activities. All holidays involve human beings coming together. So this is sociologically a critical element. Family comes together friends come together, neighbors come together. 
This has to be done. This is another aspect of giving it meaning, giving it significance. Now for the children, there might be a more fun aspect because you give them gifts. And this is critical, right? Gift giving during the Eid, uh, especially uh, the, the two Eids in Islam. Gift giving is very important and critical, particularly for the children. Uh, and uh, in some cases, you allow the child to go through the process of choosing their own gift uh, at, uh, as they are getting older. Uh, and deciding what is the best gift for them and for others. And for them to take gifts and giving it to uh, the children of the poor or the poor people uh, themselves is uh, very sociologically important and also helps them uh, get more meaning and understanding of this Islamic practice. And sharing, this idea of sharing, which we have to teach our kids, here is an opportunity to emphasize it even more. Uh, the parent gives an opportunity for the child to share gifts, to share donations, to share money with other children who uh, are less uh, of less means or who have been deprived. So aid is a time to uh, visit family, friends, neighbors, the community, and also to visit Orphans, where are the people in need? There are orphans in orphanages. There are sick people in the hospital that are in need. Um, there are homeless people, uh, depending, it varies from where you live uh, and uh, which part of the world or which country or which city uh, or which village you live in. But depending on how hard you try, you will be able to find people who are in need. Widows can sometimes be in need. Uh, people who uh, have lost, uh, who have become disabled, who have lost their arm or leg or eyesight, right? Blind people or uh, <clears throat> uh, people who uh, are soldiers who have been injured in a war or workers who have been injured in an accident. These people exist. They are around us. They are a part of us. But modern society makes them invisible pushes them away, uh, relegates them to uh, the fringes of society. Uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, provide healthy interaction between those who are healthy and capable and those who are not. So that's why uh, in many places, hospitals have become self-contained institutions, orphanages, hardly anybody goes to an orphanage, senior citizen center, the place for old people, whether it is a place for sick old people or just uh, regular old people, which are increasing around the world. Uh, <clears throat> these are places that uh, are opportunities during our festivals of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. We can take advantage of the time and the context to visit them out of pure intention to be connected to them and to also share our bounties with them and that has to be taught to our kids instead of teaching our kids that there are bad people criminals gangs don't go to that part of town uh, don't go to next to dirty people don't go to next to smelly people uh, don't go to beggars Right? Unfortunately, you hear a lot of uh, people, including Muslims, who, who teach their kids these ideas. What we need to be teaching our kids is to be wise and to be smart. But rather than labeling poor people as bad, we label the situation as bad. Poverty is a difficult situation. A poor person, we don't know why they are poor. We can find out or not. But what's more important than finding out, or in addition to finding out the difficult circumstances that led to their poverty, whether they caused it or not, is how to alleviate the poverty. So should they rely for the rest of their lives on handouts uh, and uh, gifts of money and food? Or in addition to that, should society, should we do our best 
to provide them with jobs. Right? So if you are in your car at a traffic light and somebody comes and begs for money, is that better? Or if they are selling you some bottle of water, is that better? Or selling you tissue? You see, both are poor, but one is just asking for money and the other is engaging in trade. Halal income. Which is much better. And this is something we can encourage. So we take uh, a box of candy or we uh, take some uh, pens uh, or books and give it to a poor person and say sell it and get a good income and then they can build they start to build a business they can start to build a future okay uh, socialization uh, Sanjar, as you mentioned uh, happens in this way you socialize a child into activities, into interaction with society in a wise and healthy way. So you interact with the homeless, you make sure you don't get sick, make sure that you are not, uh, they don't steal from you or they don't hurt you, make sure that the criminal gangs don't uh, steal your child. But having said that, you provide them a context where they go to the homeless person, to the beggar, to the a uh, person who is disabled and they share something in fact as soon as you can all of your zakat or as much as you can of your zakat let your child give it away you have done your job as a requirement in islam to give the zakat and if you want to add sadaqa charity uh, that's fine but do it through your child this will be an amazing socialization into uh, the world of giving for your child. So rather than teaching them zakat in a book or as a subject in school, which is important, or just talking about it, have them do it. And, and the specialist in education will tell you about this. It's experiential education, learning by doing. Have your child not just be told that poor people are important and we have have to care about them but you take them to the poor people and you show your child how to share something with the poor person in a humble way in a professional way in a smart way in a dignified way in the way that will please our creator and help us get uh, a good reward from allah but also become better uh, members of society we become uh, people who are civil. We do our civic duty. We become good citizens. So it has a religious part and also uh, a quote-unquote secular part, being better members of society, regardless of religion or race or creed or culture. Okay. Uh, I assume everybody is following so far and everything makes sense. At this point, good. Okay, uh, Bibi, you can hear us. You can. You are following along with the discussion, Bibi John. Uh, Aini Nalifa, you can hear us. You are uh, able to follow the discussion. Yes, I do. Thank you, Bibi. Aini, can you hear us? Are you able to follow our discussion? Anas, uh, can you hear us? Are you able to follow the discussion? Aisha, can you hear us? Are you able to follow the discussion? Yes, please. I do. Uh, and Aisha, I welcome you. And also, uh, it's a, a very uh, big source of uh, uh, encouragement that your uh, your logo is Allah is enough for me. 
This is a very important theme, uh, especially for Islam and family institutions. Uh, thank you for uh, having that as your uh, icon. Uh, Sanjar, thank you for your question so far. Uh, and here I will transition, uh, unless there are other questions too. Uh, yes, Aisha. All right, thank you very much for the commendation. My name is Aisha Abdullah Ibrahim. Um, I'm from Ghana and um, i'm happy to be in your class it took me three days to be accepted in your class i really didn't know how to be here but alhamdulillah um i had a bit of challenge trying to register the course but alhamdulillah it's been settled now um my question is as a mother how would you replace television and phone with regards to training your children because sometimes you realize that children are so much attached to the phone when they are disturbing you just have to get them some ipads and then focus and then move to whatever you have to do but along the line as they grow you realize they are so much attached to the gadgets than whatever you really wanted them to know so what is the balance as a worker and as a mother and another as a muslim what do you need to train them inshallah thank you uh, may Allah bless you, uh, Aisha. This is a very critical and important question. Uh, and uh, let me say before I answer that uh, we uh, are, uh, alhamdulillah, so proud uh, of uh, the community around the world, particularly the sisters and brothers from Ghana. Ghana, mashallah, is a wonderful country and has produced great leaders and great uh, civilizations uh, throughout history. Uh, we thank you for uh, finally being able uh, to join us. And here you are raising uh, one of the most critical issues for uh, modern uh, Muslim families and for all families uh, in that sense, because it is affecting uh, uh, everybody everywhere uh, in all societies. Uh, and there is uh, no quick answer. There is no easy solution. But I will uh, mention some things, and that is that uh, children are curious human beings. Uh, they uh, begin with an interest in almost everything around them. That is why they put everything in their mouth, because that is the first way for them to gain knowledge of their environment uh, around them. And then they start to touch everything, and they want to smell everything and taste everything. Uh, and this is uh, then it becomes an issue of stimulation. The problem with the smartphone, iPad TV, is it is a source of, of stimulation that attracts the child, but it leads to addiction. They cannot regulate by themselves the large amount of stimulation, uh, the attraction that is coming from uh, TV, uh, iPhone, iPad. And so the trick is from an early age as possible to provide alternative means of stimulation. And this can be playing with other children, and this can be playing outside, and this can be going into the environment uh, and swimming and climbing trees uh, and uh, engaging with the outside world, of course, in uh, a context where uh, they are uh, supervised and uh, safe. Uh, so supervision and safety is important, but it should not be uh, a matter of controlling and limiting. Unfortunately, many uh, Muslim families and non-Muslim families, especially in the modern world, in the big cities, they're living in a small place or an apartment or a house and uh, it's difficult or impossible or dangerous for the child to go anywhere by themselves. Uh, so it has to be with the parent, and the parent is usually uh, busy. Uh, so here we have a real challenge, a real problem, uh, a real difficulty. Uh, we have not yet found a solution. Uh, so some sociologists would suggest uh, that uh, reading books from an early age provides a good source of stimulation as long as you give them books rather than giving them uh, the phone. Uh, furthermore, 
uh, really, uh, for uh, many uh, scholars, uh, there is a big emphasis on uh, there really should be no TV in your house. Zero TV. Children should not have a TV inside your house. Now, you cannot control other people's houses, and they may go to their friend's house or their relative's house and see TV there. But we have control over our own houses, and there is no good reason for us to have a television in our house. If we want to hear the news, if we want to watch a movie, uh, if there is a, a program about the Quran, all that is available now on the internet. There is absolutely no need for uh, television. So you don't have that source of <clears throat> problematic stimulation and addiction uh, for a child. Later on, as they grow older, they can control uh, their uh, stimulation sources uh, and addiction. And then uh, when a child wants to play games on a phone or an iPad, here's where we have to have uh, made them used to alternative games before when they were still younger so that they play chess or they play uh, games with the dice or with the small balls before they ever get exposed to an iPad or an iPhone. So they are used to uh, manipulating their environment that makes them uh, have fun without needing an electronic source, a gadget uh, for fun. The problem with these gadgets, like you said, is they have much more stimulation than anything else. So once they start, that's it. Nothing else is as attractive or stimulating. So get them used to these other things, uh, toys, uh, uh, balls, uh, <clears throat> pets. Get a pet for your child. This is a real issue in the Muslim world, particularly, is we don't really have, or many of us, some of us, don't have a good relationship with animals. Bring an animal. Uh, animals are some of the most amazing things for children uh, and help them cognitively, emotionally. Uh, it is a great support. If you get the right pet for your child, uh, it's amazing. Teach them how to, to, to teach the child how to take care of the animal, how to how to be responsible. Uh, it's it's a lot of positive things. So these are some just some quick things. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody can do it or has access to it, but it's a conversation that we should uh, continue to have. And I'm glad that you raised this question. And please, uh, all of you, remind us of this question as we go along, so that we get more and more uh, feedback and responses. Uh, in this classroom over the next, uh, this is the second week, so we have 10 more class sessions, but as I said, uh, next week we will not have this Google Meet, uh, and uh, we encourage you all uh, to have a great Eid al-Adha. Now, during this Eid al-Adha, as you are meeting friends and family and neighbors and loved ones uh, and community members, uh, we encourage you to talk about IKI Academy. Uh, the courses at IKI Academy, the any knowledge you are learning from IKI Academy, even with people who will never become students, but just share. Uh, IKI Academy is not just for us, it's for the whole world. Uh, and so uh, let everybody know, or as many people as possible know, about uh, these courses, about uh, this knowledge and information that is uh, alhamdulillah, a great blessing uh, for all of us. Uh, and if you have criticisms of IKI Academy, and you should also uh, share those uh, with others and share it with us. Uh, we always want to improve. We're not perfect. We will never be perfect, but we can always uh, improve. As you know, with our children, we uh, need to make sure that they are aware of the two extremely important concepts of Islam, itqan and ihsan. And I mentioned this before, but I will write it down again. Uh, so we have the word itqan, which means excellence. Then we have ihsan, that I'm writing in the, in the comment section, which is improvement. Every child needs to be aware of many things, especially these two things. And those, those are two issues that need to be on their mind. So, 
hopefully we can all practice with our daughter, with our son, uh, dear uh, daughter, dear son, uh, show me an example of uh, ihsan, of improvement. Show me an example of iqan, of excellence. And then you also become an example for them of iqan and ihsan. And help them understand the difference between being perfect and striving for perfection. The fact that only Allah is perfect, but Allah wants us to try as much as possible to get as close as possible to perfection. And the notion that improvement. Things may be good, and if they are, we can make them better. And things may be bad, so we try to make them good. Things may be in good shape, we try to make them better shape. Things that are in uh, problematic, that are not working, that are in need of attention, and then we do what we can for improvement. In the physical part of our life, medical part of our life, mental part of our life, spiritual part of our life, emotional part of our life, social part of our life, economic part of our life, political part of our life, all this, there is room for uh, improvement and excellence. Now, somebody might say, well, sure. Yeah, try to make things better or uh, see if things, uh, how, how well they can be. What's the big deal? Uh, the big deal or the problem or the issue is a lot of humans don't care. Or they come up with excuses and justifications for not doing anything. And the most common is, oh, I can't do it. Yeah, it's a problem, but I can't do anything about it, or I can't solve it, or uh, it's not my responsibility, or uh, this is something for the government, or uh, I wish I had enough money, but I don't. We come up with justifications and excuses. We talk about pollution in the water. Oh, I can't clean the water. We talk about uh, pollution in the air. Oh, I can't solve the problem of clean air. We talk about uh, pollution, cutting down the forests and killing the animals and plants. Uh, the response is, well, uh, it's a big problem, but uh, I, I can't solve it. There's no way I can uh, really solve it. Uh, and, uh, so it's, there's a lot of negative reaction from some Muslims and non-Muslims around the world. That's why the problems don't get solved. Because obviously one person uh, is not the same as a big group of people. So the thinking that if I can't solve it by myself, then I don't do anything is problematic thinking that unfortunately has not been uh, correctly uh, <coughs> uh, introduced in children and so uh, they may end up having this type of thinking, and you may be involuntarily uh, conveying this type of thinking to your child. Because when the child asks for something and the parent says, uh, no, can't be done, or uh, it's impossible, or it's too hard, if they keep hearing this, then this will be part of their attitude. What the child ought to be hearing, or it's uh, more... Uh, productive for a child to hear is uh, every issue has uh, all kinds of uh, needs and requirements and we do our best we do what we can even if it is very little uh, we still participate uh, and we think about it we talk about it at the least that's the minimum let's talk about it let's think about it let's work on it let's discuss it with our friends let's discuss it with our family let's discuss it with our relatives a lot of us, or most of us, when we get together with friends and family, we don't really discuss issues or we discuss issues that are, maybe are too big for us uh, or major international problems when sometimes we need to focus on uh, more bite-sized, more uh, doable things. So in our own neighborhood, if there's a problem with trash or there's a problem with... Uh, holes in the road, or if there's a problem with uh, people who are begging, these are things we can do something about right away or with some planning. 
So you start small and you get the children involved. So they start to realize that pretty much any problem, if enough people get involved and care about it, we can start solving it. No matter what the problem is. Every problem is ultimately solvable. It's just a question of time, money, and resources. That's what it's about. And as we had said before, anything good requires time and money and effort. Anything destructive, anything bad, anything evil is cheap, easy, quick. And if you don't help children focus on the positive uh, element of production and construction, they can easily be swayed by criminal gangs or bad friends into destruction. So sometimes children, they torture animals. They hurt uh, stray cats or stray dogs. So this is quite evil. Number one, it's haram and it's uh, very inhumane and very cruel. And in many countries in the world, it's criminal. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, why would children hurt an animal or torture it or try to kill it? Either they're afraid of it, which is a problem. They haven't been taught courage and how to deal properly with animals. Or they are acting out. They see their parents fighting or they are uh, punished too severely in the house by their parents. They can't do anything about it. So they take it out on somebody or something weaker than them. So that's how some children become bullies or become uh, <clears throat> mistreaters of uh, animals and the environment is something was done to them that was hurtful and then they do it to others or to animals uh, and they become the hurtful ones. So, the, so it becomes intergenerational as it is mentioned in uh, sociology improper behavior from the parents or grandparents gets passed down to next generations. So that's why here in Islam and family institutions we emphasize the best ideas can be transferred from parents to children to grandchildren and the negative ideas can be removed, can be reduced, can be slowly eliminated or quickly eliminated, but it takes time and money and effort. Okay, let me finish up uh, the final parts of this class by talking about uh, traveling. Uh, I will be traveling with my wife to uh, uh, another state in the U.S. called Virginia to spend uh, Eid al-Adha with my parents. Uh, and so all I see some people are uh, dealing with network issues. I apologize uh, for the network issues. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, inform IKI Academy, uh, the administration about these network issues, because we're always trying to find uh, better technology, better platforms uh, for these sessions. So I thank you in advance uh, for informing the IKI administration about the connection issues. Uh, and I apologize for uh, the difficulties uh, and the technical problems. So, <clears throat> uh, traveling, why do I mention traveling? Traveling is an incredible or can be an incredible learning experience or it can be very boring and uh, very uh, <clears throat> unsatisfying. Uh, How do we teach our kids about the positive aspects of traveling and help them fall in love with traveling. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a traveler. Every prophet, pretty much, that you can think of, every messenger mentioned in the Quran, was a traveler. Whether it is Ibrahim السلام, and his family traveling between Iraq and Arabia and uh, Palestine, whether it is Musa السلام, traveling between Egypt and uh, Palestine, whether it is uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam uh, going through various uh, travels in 
uh, the Holy Land in uh, Palestine uh, and other places, and uh, Nabi Muhammad وسلم, as well, uh, before he became a prophet, was a traveling merchant uh, going between Yemen and Syria. Uh, but also as a prophet, he, he was also engaging in travel. So uh, travel is part of our history and our culture, and travel is part of humanity. Traveling makes us better human beings. Traveling civilizes our children, and it exposes us to different people, different cultures, different languages, different uh, family members, and can be so positive. But it has to be taught to our children. We have to teach our children that traveling is good and traveling is uh, better by engaging in certain uh, things. So if a child is traveling on a train or in a car and the whole time they are playing games on their uh, phone, no, then this is not what is meant by uh, a good uh, travel experience. What is meant by a good travel experience is a child uh, interacting with the environment around them and the people around them. So they go with the parent and meet other people on the train or if it's in the car uh, or the airplane, uh, they learn from the stewards on the airplane, the different parts of the airplane and how the airplane works uh, or in the car, uh, the parents explain uh, the different parts of the car and how it works and what they are seeing from the window and you challenge them to find something yellow, to find something green, uh, to find uh, things of different colors, different shapes, uh, different sizes, right? You make it education. And this is what we emphasize in Islam and family institutions. The family is a place for protection and for education and for religion. This is where it all starts, right? It starts inside the family, feeling safe, being provided for is critical in a child's life as they grow up in the family. Learning is critical in the child's uh, family and becoming person of faith is critical in a child's family. So all this begins in the family. Later on, they may go to school, they may go to the masjid, that comes later and their understanding comes later. But it starts in the family and so the family has to actively, productively, positively engage in all these activities with the child. And traveling is part of that. So the more you can take your child on travels, then the better. Of course, you can take the child to Hajj, you can take the child to Umrah, if that is uh, possible. Uh, but even if you are traveling and they cannot travel, at least you tell the person that they are staying with, uh, encourage them to take them uh, on trips as uh, much as possible. Now, some of us are more lucky than others, and we get to travel to parts of the world that uh, most of us will never get to see. That is true. That is some. That is a part of life. Some of us will have more than others, and that is a fact of life. But we don't let that hinder us. So I have been blessed by Allah. I have been to 60 countries around the world. Most human beings uh, live in the same country, in the same uh, town, in the same village all their life. I acknowledge that. And there are people who have been to 100 countries uh, or more. And so, <clears throat> if and when we can travel, we should try to do that. And that ties into what in Islam is the principle of connecting with relatives. Silatul Rahm. If you look in the Quran, Quran emphasizes Silatul Rahm, connecting with relatives, and the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as well. And he made it very clear. Don't wait for your relatives to contact you and then you respond. You should be the one who initiates the contact with all your relatives, particularly the ones who you may not like to contact. In every family, there are people, there are relatives that we like more and there are relatives we like less. In fact, in many families, there are relatives we hate and there are relatives we love. 
Islam, our religion, the Quran, Prophet peace be upon him, requires us to connect with all of them in the most wise and harmonious way. If they respond and they are positive and uh, a good relationship is established, that is good. Even if they are negative and they push you away and they do terrible things, your job is to try to connect. And then based upon their response, you can then follow up uh, in one way or another. And we teach our kids then the importance of this concept. Silatul Rahmi connecting with our relatives. It is a requirement, it is not an option. Silatul Rahmi is an obligation. It is wajib, it is required in our faith. We don't know how to do it when we are born. Somebody has to teach us. So our parents need to teach us how to do connecting with our relatives. And Eid, Eid al-Adha, for example, is a great opportunity to do this. It's a great occasion. It's a great chance. Uh, it's a door that is open to us that we may not have contacted some or all of our relatives all year. Here is a chance to do it. And we have four days to do it, at least. I'm not saying just contact your relatives during Eid al-Adha, but it's a chance to start doing it uh, with those who we have not contacted and those who we have already contacted to increase that contact. Now, what is it? What do I mean, or what does Islam mean by connecting with relatives? So it begins with communication, getting to know each other, and then giving gifts to each other, and visiting then each other, and then doing more and more activities with each other. This is absolutely important and critical for all children, or in all religions, particularly uh, for Muslim children. Very important and is one of the essential parts of your child learning how to be a civilized human being, a good human being, a productive human being, a kind human being. Do we want our children to become monsters and criminals? None of you have to answer that question because it's clear. Well, what is the opposite? Good people, high character, achievers, productive people. To get that, which we all want for our children, involves many things, particularly Silatul Rahmi, connecting with relatives. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I love to hear your comments and thoughts and concerns uh, in the next minute or two. Uh, I uh, am uh, very happy that my wife and I will be able to meet my mom and dad uh, for Eid al-Adha, Hari Raya Eid al-Adha in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, it is uh, occasion for us to connect with our uh, parents in this case. Uh, and also, uh, we will try to use this opportunity of Eid al-Abha to share about IKI Academy and also to go and visit relatives who we have not seen or whom we have not uh, connected to uh, for a long time. Uh, furthermore, uh, I hope and wish that all your families have prosperity, uh, have progress, have health. Uh, as we know, we have gone in the past years through the terrible disease of COVID. Uh, and um, It's very possible uh, that something uh, similar or different uh, arises uh, in our lifetimes again. Uh, and so we ask Allah to protect us. Uh, and to strengthen our immune systems uh, and to prevent us from this ever happening again. Okay, I will end here with salam and blessings to you and your family. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa iyaka wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.